Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Mr. Drum Archive himself, Andy Yule. Andy, welcome to the podcast. Bart, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. You are uh, one of those guys where forever you just kind of uh, see Drum Archive, which we'll explain what it is in a second, but um, and you just kind of forget, oh, there's a person behind this. Like, there is a man behind this. <laughs> Before we start and get into the, the history, maybe could you explain for someone who doesn't know what Drum Archive is? So Drum Archive, I think, is a, is a really simple idea. It is simply a collection of vintage drum catalogs. Um, there is no particular definition of vintage, um, and actually there's no particular definition of drum. There's all sorts of things on there. Um, but it's just a, a reference source um, which people can use however they wish. Yeah, very, very well put because, um, you know, you, you find all kinds of things. And I've actually found on there that um, it's always surprising. Like there's always like a little hidden something here or there that maybe I didn't, you know, see before. And uh, it, it does get updated, but it's not like it's getting updated daily. But still, you can click around and uh, and find things. And and I'll add on top of that. Basically, if you go to drumarchive.com, which everyone can do right now, and you'll see that it's just a bunch of brands. You'll see the, the, the logo of the brand. You click into that. Then you get various years and kind of the cover of the the um, catalogs. So, um, Andy, let's let's go back. And uh, what? got you into this uh, this collecting of digital catalogs, because I'm pretty sure you have collected physical catalogs as well. Um, just give us the whole story. So I was I was thinking about this the other day, how, how I started this site. And we probably have to go back to about 1998, which is from here, the very early days of the internet, um, mm -hmm. it was it was very different. We had no social media, we had no Facebook, no Twitter, no Instagram. Um, but in the late nineties, there was a place called Yahoo, and uh, there was a thing on Yahoo called Yahoo Groups, and people mm -hmm. used to get together and and create groups, and it was very simple chat forums, very simple chat things. In the late 90s, I was very much into Vistalite drums. I loved the whole acrylic thing, the see-through drums. Um, I had a real connection back to my youth, uh, seeing those on, on the music shows here in, in England. And uh, I got involved with a Vistalite group on, on, on Yahoo. Uh, and I also had an interest, a professional interest in the internet and websites. And I started off by setting up a, a website devoted to the Vistalite drums, uh, and that was called vistalites.com. And I spent a lot of time doing that. I had lots of pictures of the kits. I had the history of the kit. And as a part of that, I started to collect the catalogs because obviously, you know, we can all collect drums up to a point, but they're big, they're expensive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and actually the idea is that you can get together the whole story of, 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 of the, the line of drums, and of course, in it was it was before the re-release of Vint, of, of Vista Lights because that happened around two thousand, I think. Um, so it, at at that point, Vista Lights was a story. There was a beginning, a middle, and an end, and and it was a defined period. And so, with a house full of drums and no more space, I started to collect the catalogs uh, and the adverts for for Vista Lights, and and I scanned them in, and they all went on onto the website and 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 that that was really interesting and i had a, i had a lot of fun you know going through the catalogs looking at the material and piecing together the history of the line and as you say there is something about how times changed there's something about how styles and, mm -hmm. and fashions within drum kits changed even just within the sort of period of the vista light 72 to 80. um you know we, we had the emergence of bigger drum kits we had the emergence of stronger hardware and so on and so that that was good. I, st I, st I then kind of did the same thing with a French brand called Asba, and I set up uh, a site called asbadrums.com. Um, the Asba company has actually restarted, and they now have have the domain, they, and they run that site. But again, I, st I, I had some drums, and that's okay, but then I started to collect the catalogues and pe piece together the whole story of it. And I started to get really interested in, in the catalogues. And as you say, you can see so much about how styles change. There's something about the evolution of the modern drum kit and all the fashions and periods. And, you know, we have 
big kits and then we have concert toms and we have power toms and all that stuff. And I ended up with, with a whole load of, load of catalogs. I noticed on eBay, there were people selling CDs of scans of catalogs and these were quite expensive. Hmm. And I thought, you know what, this, this isn't really in the spirit of the internet. Um, because of course, in in the late nineties and the early two thousands, you know, the internet was 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 quite a big idea about how we can come together and share stuff and do things for good. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to scan these catalogues and I'm just going to put them online for people to share uh, and to share in this stuff. Um, so as a result of that, I I, I put together, I, I got the domain uh, drumarchive.com. It was May two thousand and one. Uh, I, I think I first registered the, doma the domain, um, and I, I, I bashed out some very simple uh, HTML, and actually it hasn't changed. The design hasn't changed. It's really basic code uh, that's yeah. driving the site. But what, um, what else would it need to be? You know what I mean? It, it is what it is. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I thought, does it need a chat forum? No, it doesn't. Does it need interactivity? No, it doesn't. It's It's just like a shelf. Full, stacked with catalogs, and that's all it is. It's a yep. shelf stack, stacked with catalogs. A load of my friends here in the UK got involved because in those days, sort of, you know, 2001 when I first started, um, it, it's kind of hard to believe now, but, but bandwidth was quite expensive. Internet storage was quite expensive. So we ended up actually setting up the archive with a lot of the files hosted on other people's servers. Mm. Um, because in those days it was, you know, it was pushing the limits of what we could do on, on one hosting contract. Um, so there was a whole, a whole group of us, uh, in, in the UK who, who could have contributed to this. And then it started to grow and people started to send material in and, and they kind of got the idea. It's not a com complicated idea. It's quite simple. Just scan your stuff, send it in, uh, and, and we share it. Um, so, so that's, that's kind of it. Not a lot happens in, on the site nowadays. And if, if you look at the site, you know, there hasn't been an update for a long time. Um, but it's there. It's still getting good traffic. People are still using it. Um, yeah. And I hope that people are finding it useful. I mean, it to me is, um, it has been brought up on the podcast uh, so often. You know, I'm, I'm hoping people will listen to that and then go and check it out over the past couple years of me doing this. But it is just such an incredible resource. And like you said, it's... Um, it's a shelf. I've never really thought about it like that, where it's not, it doesn't need to be anything too flashy. Because honestly, then sometimes that can be a little too, uh, too much clicking to get around, yeah. which it is very straightforward. I even though I like because if you look at it, you've got the brand, the logo, but you've also got a little tiny flag next to it. So you can see the country, which I find very helpful. So you you have built a, a community of people, and I like how you give credit on your site to everyone who has has contributed, which I'm sure you've made some good friends, and you've become a part of the community. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, but that's actually what I love about drums and drumming, especially is that sense of community. I don't think you get the same thing with guitarists and bass players. I, there has always been a real strong community. There's obviously something about the drum shows, going to you know meet up and, and mm -hmm. be a part of that and share stories and share experiences. Um, but yeah, you know why 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 would you not make it a community thing? Because we're not in competition with each other, and there's so many so many stories to. to tell and to share and and so much information to share and and you mentioned the brands i mean it's it, it's really interesting the brands have sometimes been quite difficult because there's a number of places where companies have produced drums under diff many different brands mm -hmm. um so like you know like miazzi in 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 italy yes. uh, who produced high percussion and wooding and and hollywood uh here in the uk premier produced Olympic and Beverly and Hammer and so on. Um, so, you know, there's 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 quite a few head scratching moments where we say, actually, you know, where do we put this? How do we do this? Um, yeah, it's that that's that's it's fascinating. I love it. Yeah. And and that's one that example in particular is very interesting with the Miyazi uh, Hollywood because it's um, there's not very much information and it's actually hard to find like an expert on these brands who would come on and talk about it.
And if you do, I run into the problem a lot of uh, they don't speak English and they're not comfortable with coming on. Um, I've run into that problem with um, tricks on um, where because there's sometimes where people they they do and I'm sure they'd be perfectly fine, but it is a little bit daunting and, and scary to come on a podcast that is based in America where people are speaking English and it's not your 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 first language. Um, which of course we would figure it out, but, um, yeah, I mean, do you ever run into any, I'm sure you, I would hope you don't, but do you ever run in, into any legal things where companies are saying, please don't do this. It's copyright or anything like that. So I've, I've, I've never had problems with the legal thing. Um, as I mentioned, I started with Vista lights and when I first registered the domain for Vista lights.com, uh, obviously at that point, Ludwig weren't producing Vista Lights, but I assume they still had the trademark. They still owned, owned, owned the name. Um, there was also a company producing little lights that go on bicycles that were called the Vista Lights. Oh. So there was another thing called Vista Light. And that's why I registered the domain and I thought, you know, what of it? Something might happen, something might. I never had any problems. Um, I bumped into Jim Catalano at the Chicago show in the early 2000s, and we had a good chat about VistaLights.com. By that point, they had relaunched the Vista Light line, um, and uh, there was never any any problem, any any threat, any any concern. And in fact, you know, when I when I closed that site down, it just felt like the right thing to do to gift the domain back to them because it's their name, it's not my name, and I, yeah. I had no claim. But I think I I think as long as as long as you are respectful, and as long as you are not obviously you know trying to get some money out of it or, or do, you know, do, do yeah. on the back of their brand. I, I think the drum companies are probably quite happy with the idea that somebody is curating and yes. celebrating their heritage, especially around the 2000s when a lot of the drum fashion became focused on heritage and looking back to the past and capturing that. Obviously, there was the Vista Light look relaunch, but you know, a lot of the other companies sort of got very big into that heritage thing. So yeah. actually having somebody there who's independently curating and celebrating the heritage, um, I, I would like to think they're quite happy with it. There's never been any problems, but you are right. They own the copyright. Um, and if anyone you know was, was to create in, any problems, then yeah, you know, I, I couldn't fight it if they were inclined to do so not that they should or would but but i mean we we are a um i've learned as i've kind of gotten more into the community of like it's smaller than you would think uh mm -hmm. because we kind of you know you meet the people and and these people in the at the at the drum companies are fans of drums they probably love your website i mean just even not only looking at their own brand of drums on there but but other companies because at the core of it we're all nerds who like drum <laughs> stuff. I mean, and um, it's it's just all very positive. I guess I would be in the same boat too, though, in a, in a similar way of doing episodes on Gretsch and Ludwig and using the name Gretsch and Ludwig and all this stuff and DW and Rogers. But, you know, it's it's all just to promote. It's a it's a I'm not going to People listen to this and they may maybe go, oh, let me look at um, let me look into Fibes. I have your website up here. Let me look at Fibes. Let me look at Heyman. Let me look at this. It just kind of leads to I mean, what's the harm? You know what I mean? It's it's all very um, it's all, it's it's educational. It's kind of has that caveat of like this is an educational website. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 I think it might be different if I was making money out of it. Yeah. Um, but the reality is I pay a bit of money every year for the hosting. Um, and I put a bit of time into the site, but you know, I'm not, I'm not earning out of it. So why, why would any drum company come back and give me a hard time? Really? I, I don't think anyone would care. I mean, but it's safer not to, I'm sure you have a reason not to, but you know how obviously through Google or whatever, you can, you can add that little bar at the top with a banner ad where you get a little income, but I'm sure you're doing fine. And it's that, that would be not that what's the point, I guess. Yeah, there's there's no point, and and actually the simplicity of the site, I just a banner ad would just mess it up. Really, I just want <laughs> no. But seriously, you're right. You know, I like that you care enough to not do that, and you would rather have a nice, clean, beautiful website as opposed to something that has like you know an ad for someone who, if you were just googling sneakers, you're going to get sneaker ads on yeah, your yeah. 
your website. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Have there been any that you think are your like, uh, you know, I've been looking for this forever. You're some some like holy grail moments for you where you go, oh, I found it. You know, I found my uh, Camco ads or Brady or whoever, Beverly. I'm in the B section on your website right now <laughs> where, oh, um, boy, I found it, you know. So I mean, in in the early days when it all started off, I guess the the Vista Light Tivoli mm -hmm. um, was you know the the the, the brochure um, because that was such an iconic drum kit. Obviously, that was the thing that kind of broke the Vista Light line yeah. uh, in the end because the lights kept failing. Um, but that was that was quite special on a on a personal level. Um, the catalogue that, that has always got me excited was actually the first catalogue I've ever got, which was the 1980 Premiere catalogue. Um, and it is the catalogue with uh, the silver resonator on the on the front cover. It has the four rack toms and the two floor toms. As a 12-year-old just starting out to play the drums in 1981, that catalogue absolutely rocked my world yeah um it was the days of concert toms it was the days of big kits and i just spent hours and hours and hours looking at that catalogue and i yeah. wanted every kit in that catalogue and it was such an emotional connection for me so when i was able to get a copy of that catalogue on on ebay a number of years later um that was a very special moment, but that has nothing to do with the value of the drums or any rarity, to be honest. That's just what floats my boat. Yeah. Yeah. Which I, I quickly found it because of the way you have it lined up with you find the brand, you find the year and there it is. And it's a very cool. I mean, that is a drum set that a kid that that's the drum set that makes you want to play because it, the way it's yeah. lit uh, and 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 just I, I love the layout of these old catalogs have, have you as a fan of these catalogs done much research into the um i don't know the history kind of, of of the creation of catalogs and and that that side of things because they're you know you could say yeah a photographer shoots a picture they do the layout they release it but i feel like there's a little bit more information there on on all these companies creating catalogs you know yeah i mean i i, I haven't researched the process but I tell you, by by just looking at the catalogues and looking at them over time, and and you sort of touched on this in 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 the introduction, there is something about the extent to which they reflect the era. So you know, the premier catalogue from around 1967 uh, features a guy behind a drum kit with a lady in a cocktail dress just kind of draped over it. You'd never yep, get see. away with that today. <laughs> yeah, that would be deemed so inappropriate. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting how drum companies have changed and probably actually become a lot more sophisticated in terms of how they market their product. So in the 1960s, your snare drum options would have been metal or wood. No drum company would go out to market today advertising their drums as metal or wood. I mean, yeah. for wood, obviously, it would be maple or birch and how yeah. many plies and what bearing edges. And it's become so scientific nowadays. Yes. And, you know, the the, the values and the, the way that companies pitch and promote and describe uh, their 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 product um, has, has changed enormously over the years. And, yes, there's a fashion thing. You know, the 80s were very light and day glow. Mm -hmm. um, the seventies, it was all about big hardware and concert toms. Um, yeah. So you know, you can see all of these trends, all of these trends. It's fascinating. It is I'm such a geek. I love it. No, but it's it's like it, it just never ends. It's so much more to look into. And the nineties, I feel like you see more of the like um, you would see the, and I'm referring basically to some like Sabian ads and things. But you'd see the like Chad Smith or the, the more of the visual of like here's the drummer and they're standing there holding their snare and they've got long hair and a bandana and it's very uh, but but going back to how you said with the premiere ad where there's, you know, the woman who's kind of got her hair, she's holding her hair. There was a lot of that with Rogers and things like that, where it was, um, uh, you know, they would it would be very sexualized uh, where where and it would be the man in kind of a tuxedo and the, and the woman tricks on had some ads like that, which were those are especially cool, colorful ads, the old tricks on ones. But um, yeah. It's a different time. I don't think anyone looks at it now and goes, you know, ooh, we don't like that. It's just you you look at it and it's um 
I heard someone say once about movies uh, in, when I was in school, they were talking, it was like a film class and they were talking about how a movie, good or bad, no matter if it's the worst movie in the world, it gives you a snapshot into that time. Be it if it's an example of the way, you know, the quality of the camera, if it's the cars in the background, if it's anything. And I think that that translates over to this where it lets you see, you know, if it's the most interesting ad in the world or not. It just lets you see kind of what was happening at that time, you know, what the style of clothing people were wearing. I think you can get more out of it than just kind of looking at it and go, okay, wood snare, metal snare. Um, it just lets you see, oh, they, they they like to use the stripes a lot in this year or or all that good stuff. Um, and I feel like there was probably competition between brands, you know, like to have the better catalog at the time. Oh, I, I'm I'm... I'm sure there was because, of course, in in those days, and this is all pre-internet, um, the catalog was, I guess, the the primary tool for for marketing and and positioning the product uh, on on the marketplace. So it was it was hugely important to the companies back then mm -hmm. that they produced a really good catalog because that spoke obviously that spoke about the specification and and the options and all that kind of technical stuff but actually that spoke so much more about the presentation and the value and the style and all of that stuff which is again all about that emotional connection and that's what drives people to make that purchasing decision i guess yeah i mean i think of being a kid and being on uh drum websites um and just looking at it because i came up i was born in 90 so kind of coming up and you know i'd be 10 and around 2000 and it would be like, you know, that time where the internet, you know, you got your dial up internet and you're looking at brands, what you're on Ludwig.com or whatever, DW's website. That's how I would connect because you wouldn't really physically have, I mean, you would have catalogs at that point in time, but it was just kind of a different, it wasn't the same. Um, the question would be though, how, how do you, how would young drummers, old drummers, famous drummers, anyone receive the catalog? Would it typically be a stack of them at a shop and you would grab one when you're there or would it be mail or you'd order one? How would that work? Yeah. So it was, uh, it, it was largely through the dealer network. Um, I mean, that's how I got that 1980 premier catalog. I went to the local drum shop. They were a premier dealer. I had that in my hand. That was special. Um, so it was through the dealer network. Yes, they were doing mail order uh, for for the catalogs, um, music shows, music fairs, music events. Um, but I think it was mostly through 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 the dealer network, and that I think in a way, you know, that made it very localized because you 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 kind of had to be in the locale of a dealer to have access to this material in those days. It obviously is completely different now with the internet. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you you kind of had to have that 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 locality, that 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 connection with with the brand. The yeah. internet has has completely changed everything. Um, and as you say, you know, we can dial up any website now, go and look at at the product. And in a sense, that's great because you can have you know the different websites open on your screen at the same time, and you can do a direct comparison and do all that. But there is a downside to this because we don't with the websites we don't capture the moment in time yes and in 20 years time when today's pearl or tama or yamaha kits are the vintage i think it's going to be quite difficult to go back and capture that moment in time in quite the same way that we can with the physical catalog because the physical catalogs were printed they were done and that's it it's it's frozen in time yeah and i think i think we've kind of lost that with the internet yeah and it's almost like a um you can't quite go back or you can't quite go home sort of thing where like if they made catalogs now it would be sort of uh for the sake of like like a throwback or whatever because at that point it was what you had it is like like albums like now it's neat to hold it and it's awesome to have yeah. a big album but at that point it was all you had where when you might listen to an album but then in five minutes you're going to go listen to spotify or whatever because it's easier um so it, it is it, that is an interesting point where i'm sure i that that i guess leads to another question of do do brands still i i've seen i know they have pamphlets you get them at the drum shows i've got some cool ones that i've gotten um but is it still 
in vogue for brands to have catalogs and materials that are widespread or is it more of a, you know, you might get it at a trade show kind of thing? I I get the sense, certainly here in, in England, I, I get the sense that there's very little being printed now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I haven't seen uh, a physical catalog for for many years, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and actually, as, as you know, if I was on the market to buy a new kit today, I would want to go to the website because it's it's absolutely current. If it's yes. on the website, it's now. It's absolutely current. Yes, you know this is this is why we do the internet, I guess. Um, I'm I'm not aware of anyone producing catalogs in any quantity or any significance now. Yeah, and I think there's like as you click through drumarchive.com, there's there's differences of like what you'll refer to as like a flyer or a catalog or things like that, or like it might be like a pamphlet or something, which like they still do. I mean, it shows there still are like things that you can physically hold, but I don't think they're, they're being produced every year or biannually with, with, uh, you know, a substantial amount of gear and pictures. It might be more of like a reference at drum shows, but do you know when would, would be the, (laughs) It's hard to say when the end of it was because it's still it's probably not really, really over, but it yeah. maybe 90s. Does that seem fair to say that it was kind of the, the end of the catalog? I, I I think it's probably around the 2000s. OK, um, I think in, in the 90s, because because it, it it's essentially been put out by the rise of the Internet uh, and the extent to which Internet access is now ubiquitous. Yeah. Um, so it, it's probably around the 2000s. Yep. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the, the big drum companies now put a lot of time and effort into their websites. Yes. And obviously, you, you can do things on a website. You can have video on a website. You can have audio clips on a website. It, yep. it's, it, it is genuinely a multimedia experience, which you obviously don't get with your, with your shiny, glossy uh, catalogue. But... Yeah, I'm a bit old school. I just like to hold it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But again, it's with the power of the internet, you can zoom in um, and and digitally kind of look at it and, and enhance it, which is really neat. Um, one thing too, as I look at your website and I just see all the different flags, it's like it really crosses borders, these, these catalogs of like the layout is really pretty similar from I'm looking there's Hoshino in Japan there's high percussion in Italy there's Heyman in England there's Honer in Germany uh Dandy in Australia I mean but if you click into them they they're pretty similar it's like they're all kind of following a format which which really levels the playing field across the globe uh for drummers of of what was presented to them absolutely there 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 is there is a, a very clear format that they all followed You'd start off with a page or two of your top endorsers. Mm -hmm. You'd then have your kits and you'd start off with your most desirable kits and then kind of work down the range to maybe your entry level kits. Then you have um, hardware, snare drums, bass drum pedals, accessories and so on. There was some interesting stuff in the 70s and 80s when many of the catalogues included things like symbols. Uh, so I guess in those days, the cymbal companies would have local distribution deals with the drum companies. So I have a, I have a Pearl catalog from Japan, which has, I think, Peisty cymbals, mm-hmm. uh, listed, uh, and, and so on. That was, that was quite, I think also drum heads, um, you know, they, they list Remo or Evans drum heads. Um, but there, there, there is a, a, a I think pretty much a formula. Ludwig did things a little differently. Ludwig started off not with the endorsers. Ludwig started off with the company. Yeah. And so if you look at something like the 1980 Ludwig catalog, you'd have Bill Ludwig II and Bill Ludwig III uh, on on that, that second page. And then you would have, you know, the senior management and the sales team listed over a couple of pages. And that sense, actually, that Ludwig still was a family thing and it was a big company and a sure. togetherness thing. Um, that was that was quite unusual. I like that. I do really like that. It says, you know, these are the people behind your drums. I ended up, uh, when I was collecting Vista Lights, I ended up buying uh, a parade snare drum that had the name Leo Palace stenciled on the case. And I worked out that he actually was one of the sales reps for Ludwig, and mm. I found his picture 
in the catalog and I made that connection with it and it was great. Yeah. Oh, I mean, now I think of like, I mean, from doing the show, I've kind of met a lot of these people, but like, you know, I think of like Ludwig and like you think of Jim Catalano and Uli Salazar, like you, you, you if you, if you get involved a little bit more than just kind of like watching from the outside, you do learn who these people are and it's mm. similar nowadays. I mean, cause you find them on Facebook and stuff. It's, it's very similar. And, and I'm on, I'm on, um, the Ludwig page right now of your site. And it, it it's interesting, Ludwig especially, because it gets kind of, I'm sure you maybe had to have a, you had to have a moment of where do I put this with brands where it becomes WFL, it becomes Leedy and Ludwig. And it goes, well, what does this go in Leedy or does this go in Ludwig or where does this one go? Uh, it must have, yeah, you must have had to think about it a little bit. Yeah, I, I, I did. And I, I kind of broke my own rules as well because I have created a section specifically for Vistalite, uh, which is obviously not a company. It was a brand that Ludwig did, but because of the history of the site and because it actually all started with the Vistalite catalogs, uh, I've ended up with um, with with a whole little section to, to devoted to the Vistalites. But yeah, the company histories are 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 really sometimes quite challenging. Yeah, um, and and sometimes I will get I, someone will send in a catalog from a brand I've never heard of, and I think, well, you know how. What do I do with this? How do I find this? So, yeah. You know. Well, that's a great point because these brands, I mean, really, and and what came to mind first when you said that from looking on here was um, brands like like Orange, where we think of like Orange amps who are still yep. very popular, but Orange drums, you know, it looks like that was 1975 to like 80, and those are really cool. Those are also like you know, 12 year olds drooling over their catalog kind of covers with big, you know, big drums and stuff like that. But maybe it just would have disappeared. You know, I'm sure people would have remembered, but a generation later. Yeah. And it makes you think what, what else there's got to be a couple brands that are just lost, you know? Absolutely. And so the orange drums were made by Capel. Um, and so when the orange material came in, I thought, you know, do I put this with the Capel? stuff or do I do I give it its own page um yeah. and I I figured yeah give it its own page it was a brand it was marketed in its own right yeah um but yeah there's 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 all sorts of of quirks and anomalies around this there is and hearing you talk about it you really it really lets you look at this at a deeper level cuz well, I just clicked on capel and you go oh yeah that's basically the same cover as orange with a different drum set. It's like the 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 graphic designer of the day just kind of went, okay, Capel logo goes here. All right, orange logo goes here. <laughs> it's really similar. I mean, these are uh, very, very interesting. Another question I have for you would be about um, early catalogs. Uh, it seemed like it was somewhat common, and I've heard about this on the show, where something was in the catalog, but no one has physically ever seen that drum. <laughs> like, like, like it, maybe it was a prototype. Maybe they just didn't make it. Have you any experience kind of seeing that and learning about that? Um, I've, I've never seen anything in a catalog that I didn't think was made. Hmm. I have seen various things appear in real life that never appeared in the catalog. That's interesting. The other way. Um, yeah. The other way around. Um, and I mean, it may, maybe not, not huge differences, but I, I, I guess, uh, you know, for example, on on a snare drum, a particular combination of lugs and strainer, uh, or a particular shell size or something that never made it into the catalog, and yet these things these things appear on 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 the forums on on the internet, and there's quite a lot of that. But I guess a lot of that is due to the fact that, that, that there was a cycle of production for these catalogs. It might have been annual. It might have been you know less frequent than that. But of course, I guess there was continual production changes uh for the company so there's pro there's there's all sorts of drums out there that 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 weren't in in the catalogs i've never come across a thing in a catalog i must admit and and i'm sure there are many experts out there who will know more about that than i do yeah and i think i'm just referring to people who would say like um you know oh this wrap was advertised or this size or this um configuration like you said and and there are the master collectors who have every single drum and they say oh, i've never been able to find that which maybe means yeah. they made 10 of them or something. Um, but it, it's also interesting, too, because uh, from my experience looking at these early, early catalogs will have a lot of um, 
you know, you go back to the trap drummer stuff where there was like bird whistles and all this stuff and, and ratchets and things like that, where, uh, it was a lot of, um, very detailed, a lot of skews, a lot of items in there, which it seems like over the years, it kind of got pared down a little bit to be less line items and prices and more about the visual and the picture. Yeah, and I, I, I think, and, and it's interesting, there, I, I think there was definitely a moment when the catalog and the price list separated. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was probably a, a, a quite a significant moment. And and obviously, you know, the, the, as, as the marketing developed and, and they moved into other markets, to other, other territories, I guess, you know, you, you, you would want to do that. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the scale of stuff, some of the very old stuff, um, I guess it it reflects the extent to which the the role of the drummer has changed, and actually what what it means to be a drummer now, as opposed to what it meant to be in a drummer in in you know maybe the nineteen forties or nineteen fifties. Yeah, it was a very different world back then. Yeah, yeah, it almost seems more um, like catalogs in the seventies, eighties, nineties became more about trying to grab people's attention and get people really interested in the drums from a flashy cover versus earlier, you know, pre-1960 and, and before that, it was almost more like a, uh, you know, for the industry, I need a new snare, okay, number, whatever, well, here's the price. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it was, it was all about the technical specification. Yes. It was all about the size, the type of rims, the, the heads, whatever. It was it was simply about the specification. Yeah. Um, but but you're you're right. It's it's now. It, I guess I guess the 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 selling the marketing needs to connect with people on in, on a very different level. Yeah. Um, and I guess that probably reflects how marketing has changed more generally. This is not just about drums, is it? You know, it's the way everything is marketed now. Sure. We're all buying into a lifestyle. We don't we don't buy products. We buy a lifestyle. <laughs> and I guess that applies to drums as much as it does to anything. I think you're right. Um, and 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 just to back up, and you said about the price list, how it's separated, because on your site, you there are literal like oh, like someone asked me one time, hey, do you know what this drum is, and do you know how much it would have cost? Of course, I immediately go to drumarchive.com. And, and, and a lot of times, though, you would find a price list where you'd have to find the drum because, you know, and, and you know, I don't want to say it's annoying, but it would sort of be back in the day like, all right, well, how much does the thing cost? It's like on a menu if there's no price and it's like mm -hmm. market price or something. It's like, well, what is the price? Just tell me <laughs> yeah, yeah. where you'd have yeah, yeah. to refer to another pamphlet or something like that, you know. But I guess I guess that's that's the thing about, you know, if 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 you were picking up your catalog at your local dealer, um, you then kind of want, you you want to start that conversation sure. about the price and actually maybe not putting the price in the catalog forces the customer to speak to the dealer and actually strike that conversation up. So maybe it was, it was quite a powerful thing yeah. to take the prices out of the catalogs. So yeah. there's some, con with every category in the world, there's some dark things that I think it's good to avoid, but but also maybe just kind of touch on because it, it you know, you don't want to repeat history, but have you come across any controversial things where you said, I don't want to put that up? I haven't, I haven't put in, I've, I've had nothing that I've felt inappropriate to go up. Yeah. I've never censored anything. And I, and I think there was actually something about, you know, the going back to the, the ideal of this, it is, it is a reference source. And I think if, if it is to be uh true, to its mission as being a reference source. We we sometimes have to be prepared to put stuff up or deal with stuff that we might not be comfortable with nowadays. And I think, yeah. you know, as long as we're doing that sensitively um, and, you know, Drum Archive passes no judgment on anything, it's a bookshelf. Exactly. Uh, so if it's there, that's that's what was done in in the day. And, yeah. and you can put your own interpretation on that. So. It's really interesting, I think, sometimes too. It's kind of a game to kind of click through the website with these very, very old companies and see, try and find what the earliest ones are, like Noakes and Nikolai and things like that, and these these brands where it's in the twenties, and and it's kind of like you know how early can you find uh, with these? And I and, and I think if 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 you step back from the individual companies and look at the site as a whole what you have here is a record of the evolution of our instruments. Yes. Um, because you can see how it has changed the things that have, the, 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 the developments that have happened over, over the years, um, the things that they tried and, you know, weren't successful. 
Uh, and there's lots of oddities and there's lots of things that people tried at different times. You had the Pearl, the Pearl extender range where they put the, the bigger lugs on to put bigger heads on the shelves. Yeah. Um, and uh, all sorts of you know strange things like that, that that came and went. But step back from it all and you actually get a real sense, I think, for how the instrument has evolved over the last century. And perhaps that's the best thing about it. Yeah. It's neat too, because people might look at this and and just say, what, you know, what is that? I've never seen that before. It's really, it's, there's a lot of oddities and, and things like that. And even then you have um, like Pete Englehart um, metal percussion where truly works of art. I mean, there are some things that you, you, you really wouldn't see anywhere else. And um, I just think it's a great, great resource that I have been on this website so many times and I still to this day looking now kind of over, you know, to the side while we're doing this to kind of keep up with it. I'm just like, oh, my God, I haven't seen that one before. And it's interesting because to know that you have not been updating it that much. It's not like I'm like missing things daily where, oh, you know, Andy updated something new. It's just the sheer amount of information on there. It's just such a good, good resource. All right, Andy. Well, this has just been awesome. Um, usually at the end, I say, is there anything people want to promote? Obviously, we're promoting drumarchive.com. I mean, I think that's any anywhere else you want to direct people to to see what you've got going on. Yeah, no, just 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 visit the site, spend time there, look, learn, and if you come across something that we haven't got, please send it in. Love it. That's so cool. It's it's like community based. It's like peer to peer kind of you know bef way early version yeah. of that. Um, so. Andy has been kind enough. He's going to hang out for a Patreon bonus episode, and he's going to he shared some really cool information with me. Uh, so what we're going to talk about is I didn't know this, and I still don't know the answer. He's going to tell me in a minute. But uh, Vista Lights originally had a different name, and that appeared in the catalog. And uh, Andy's kind of teased it a little bit to say, you know, you got to join Patreon to find out. So if you're interested in finding out from someone like Andy, who's very, very interested in Vista Lights, then um, you can join Patreon. Go to drumhistorypodcast.com. There's a Patreon button. Two bucks a month gets you the um, bonus episodes, and there's a couple tiers up from that. So Andy, it's just been awesome to get to meet you and put a face behind the, uh, the website that I, I visit, I would say, man, probably three or four times a week. I was on it last night. Unrelated to just us doing this interview, I was looking up things about um, Frank Wolf drums for a Chick Webb episode that will be out before this. But where else would I go? It would it, it, you've taken out so much of the hunt and the guesswork in this. And I think all of us uh, drum nerds owe you a big thank you for for doing what you've done. I appreciate it. That's really kind of you to say so. Thanks, Bart. And it's been it's been great to meet you, and I've really enjoyed chatting about the site. Thank you. <laughs>